Brain lesion differential diagnosis, infratentorial masses. The posterior fossa or infratentorial compartment is the space below the tentorium cerebelli. This is a tent-shaped dural reflection that attaches to the fox cerebri. At the junction of the tentorium and the fox, there is a long straight sinus, which is called the straight sinus. The contents of the posterior fossa include the brain stem, all three parts, midbrain, pons, and medulla, the cerebellum, including the hemispheres and the vermis, as well as the cerebrospinal fluid in the subarachnoid space and the cisterns. If we look at these coronal MR scans taken after the injection of gadolinium, we can see the tentorium is peaked at the center and is concave upwards underneath the occipital and the temporal lobes. We can see the superior sagittal sinus at the top of the image on the right. We can see contrast enhancement in the two internal cerebral veins, which are a good landmark for identifying the enhancement in the tentorium cerebelli. The posterior fossa, or infratentorial compartment, is the space below the tentorium cerebelli. In this last coronal section, we can see how the fox cerebri attaches to the tentorium cerebelli, and at the junction of these dural reflections, we have the superior sagittal sinus, the straight sinus, and the transverse sinus. The posterior fossa is below tentorium. If we look at this sagittal MR section and this sagittal drawing, we can see how the Fox cerebri separates the two cerebral hemispheres, and we can see on the sagittal MR the straight sinus, and we can imagine a dotted line indicating the attachment of the tentorium at the anterior margin of the straight sinus going forwards to attach to the anterior clinoid process. The posterior fossa, again, is the volume of the brain that is below the tentorium that is anterior to the straight sinus and posterior to the clivus. There are several different sublocations for posterior fossa lesions. We have extraaxial lesions, most commonly in the cerebellopontine angle cistern, including schwannoma, meningioma, and epidermoid inclusion cyst. We have intraaxial lesions involving the cerebellum, and we have intraaxial lesions involving the brainstem, most commonly involving the pons. If we look at this cartoon schematic of posterior fossa masses, we can imagine a lesion that is extraaxial in the cerebellopontine angle cistern, and this would include schwannoma, meningioma, and epidermoid inclusion cyst. A lesion involving and expanding the pons and other portions of the brainstem is likely to be an astrocytoma. A lesion that is filling the fourth ventricle is likely to be an ependymoma, especially in children. A midline lesion involving the vermis is likely to be a medulloblastoma in children. And a hemispheric lesion especially one that is biphasic, a fluid-secreting tumor like a pilocytic astrocytoma or a hemangioblastoma, would be the most common lesions. If we think about the differential diagnosis for the extraaxial lesions in the cerebellopontine angle cistern, we have the possibility of having a lesion that is involving the internal auditory canal, and that would most likely be a schwannoma, although we can also have schwannomas of the fifth or the trigeminal nerve. We have vessels in the subarachnoid space, so aneurysm is possible, as well as an arachnoid cyst. We could have a meningioma or metastatic disease, and we could have, again, an epidermoid inclusion cyst. This is why we always give the same differential diagnosis whenever there is a cerebellopontine angle mess. In terms of the relative frequency of these different cerebellopontine angle masses, 
by far the most common is the schwannoma, and these most typically arise from the inferior division of the vestibular nerve, a portion of the eighth or the vestibulocochlear nerve. The second most common lesion is a meningioma that may arise from the arachnoid attached to the tentorium cerebelli or arachnoid attached to the dura of the petrous bone. And of course we can have many other lesions, but the third most common lesion is going to be the epidermoid inclusion cyst. Let's take a typical case. A 45-year-old man presents with asymmetric high-frequency hearing loss greater on the right side than the left. This could be presbyacusis, the normal aging process that reduces hearing. But when we look at the MR scan, we can see it is grossly abnormal. This axial T2 weighted MR demonstrates a significant lesion. In scanning the image, we want to compare the left side of the picture with the right side of the picture. And if we go up and down, we can clearly see the mass lesion. If we look at the mass lesion more carefully, we can identify that the lesion is involving the internal auditory canal and the lesion is extraaxial as demonstrated by enlargement of the subarachnoid space at the margin of the lesion. This tumor or mass is pushing on the brainstem at the level of the pons and is distorting the location and the volume size of the fourth ventricle. If we compare the internal auditory canals on both sides, we can see that the internal auditory canal is larger where it is expanded by a fluid-filled or cystic portion of the tumor. The new image that we see on the left-hand side of your screen is a coronal enhanced MR scan demonstrating enhancement of the mass and also clearly showing the distortion of the brainstem, the displacement, and the enlargement of the subarachnoid space at the edge of the lesion. So we have a 5 centimeter left cerebellopontine angle enhancing mass lesion which is involving the IAC or the internal auditory canal. The differential diagnosis for this includes vestibular schwannoma, other types of schwannoma, meningioma, metastatic disease, and lymphoma. But by far the most likely possibility is going to be a vestibular schwannoma. And that was the diagnosis that was made at surgery and pathological examination. Vestibular schwannomas have been called acoustic neuromas and neurofibromas, but these are antiquated terms and they have been supplanted by the term schwannoma or more properly vestibular schwannoma. As mentioned earlier, these tumors most commonly arise from the inferior division of the vestibular nerve. The hearing loss is thought to be mechanical compression of the cochlear portion of the eighth nerve inside of the bony internal auditory canal. The goals of surgery are primarily and first preservation of the facial nerve motor function to, remain, to retain facial symmetry and preservation of hearing. So in this cartoon, we imagine that a cerebellopontine angle mass that is extraaxial is rounded, but it's very, very important to identify that the tumor is actually involving the internal auditory canal, as these lesions most commonly arise inside of the canal, because that is where the progenitor Schwann cells are living. So this is a fairly typical case of a cerebellopontine angle mass that is a vestibular schwannoma. Schwannomas are relatively common tumors, about 5 to 10 percent of all intracranial tumors, histologically benign and slowly growing. And in patients who have neurofibromatosis type 2, they may present in the second and the third decade, while most sporadic and solitary schwannomas will present in the fourth through the seventh decades. The majority of schwannomas are sporadic, but when these lesions are multiple, they are probably part of neurofibromatosis type 2. As mentioned earlier, the progenitor cell is the Schwann cell, which makes the peripheral myelin. The central myelin is made by the oligodendrocytes. As the nerves pass out of the brain stem and through the subarachnoid space, they typically have oligodendrocytes. Once they enter the internal auditory canal, 
then we see the Schwann cells forming the myelin sheath. So schwannomas typically begin as a small round mass inside the auditory canal, an intracanalicular lesion. Although the tumors begin inside of the internal auditory canal, the path of least resistance and the growth vector for these tumors is out of the IAC and into the cerebellopontine angle cistern. It's been known for quite some time that these tumors do not arise from the cochlear or auditory portion of the eighth nerve, but in fact arise from the vestibular portion of the nerve. And the percentage or ratio of origin from the inferior versus the superior vestibular nerve has been clarified over the years so that the recent literature indicates that the vast majority of schwannomas involving the cerebellopontine angle cistern and IAC are actually arising from the inferior vestibular nerve. If we imagine how these tumors can grow, we can look at the tumor in the patient's right cerebellopontine angle cistern and recognize that the tumor is clearly involving the internal auditory canal, which is also expanded. Look at the shape of the mass. It looks just like an ice cream cone. And this is the classic shape that we see in larger vestibular schwannomas. If you were buying ice cream, you would want to make sure that it's not only the three scoops on the top, but also the ice cream in the cone that you are paying for. So this patient who has bilateral cerebellopontine angle masses and bilateral involvement of the internal auditory canal has neurofibromatosis type 2, NF type 2. And here is a second patient who has NF2 demonstrating not only bilateral cerebellopontine angle masses, but also an enhancing tumor in the cavernous sinus, which was a schwannoma of the trigeminal nerve. This has been a short discussion of uh, the cerebellopontine angle mass and its differential diagnosis.